Hey guys, today I want to talk a little bit about the demi-humans in Elden Ring because yeah, they are just like this world enemy and we don't think much about them, they're just another mob for us to kill. But I started to think about them because of the last video I did, some of the comments there. And also, one of my favorite characters in the game is a demi-human and that would be sweet little Bok, Bok the Seamster, whom we will get more into later on. Visually, I think they're really interesting because they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them look like chimpanzees, some of them look like mice, and some of them look kind of like dogs. And then of course we have the demi-human queens, and you get to fight a few of these in the game. And one of them drops a demi-human queen's staff. So it says that it was a gift once given to the demi-humans to foster peace. It can be wielded even by those of low intelligence, sneered at by fools in the academy. This makes me picture Ryu Lucaria as this beneficial, sort of honorable presence that was trying to promote peace instead of trying to just conquer. They wanted to find out what the problem was and, okay, maybe let's, let's bridge this divide by teaching them some sorcery and seems like not everyone at the academy agreed but I think that's kind of like a sweet little backstory there with the academy and the demi-humans. But if we go back to that clip of the demi-human queen fight, you can see in the very beginning she uses her staff to cast a glintstone pebble and then she starts using the staff as a physical weapon and she eventually looks like she's trying to conjure up a, a spell and then just throws it out of frustration. And I thought that's such a great detail that I would have never thought was significant had I not been looking for it. This clip actually came from my Windmill Village video and someone in the comments said, oh, what if the mage from the academy is trying to teach the demi-humans, like trying to teach them sorcery? And that would perfectly align with the staff as they were trying to maybe bring them some civilization, maybe trying to make them less hostile, trying to build them up a little bit. But they do seem like they just hate everybody. You find them all throughout the game. Here they are in Mountaintops of the Giants, killing some bats. Here they are killing me. So it just, yeah, it just seems like they're just aggressive. They hate everybody. Almost everybody, because they love one person. They love Papa Kenneth. So Kenneth hate, if you recall is crying from atop of this, this part of the ruins and he's asking if you can go save his fort which is being camped by some of Godric's soldiers. Once you clear out the fort you go back to Kenneth and Kenneth will tell you okay great now I can move on to my plan of re-establishing communication with the demi-humans because under the Erd tree humans and demi-humans commingled in peace. And there's a ghost outside of Fort Hate that backs this up as well. And when you talk to the ghost, it says that the demi-humans wax wroth. Now their mother's been taken. Where are you, Lord Kenneth? This, of course, opens up a whole another load of questions like their mother, who's their mother, who's taken her, and how far back does this relationship with Lord Kenneth go? But it is clear that Kenneth has a good rapport with them. They trust him. He can get through to them. He can obviously communicate with them in a way that they, they appreciate and they respect. And when you go back to Fort Hate, it now has demi-humans in there. And they hate you. <laughs> they will attack you. But Lord Kenneth is just at the top of it. And he's safe. He's safe with them. But this made me love him. I thought he's like this nice, honorable guy that isn't... He's not trying to backstab them. It was the first thing he wanted to get back to. He said, okay, I, I'm going to get back to my plan of trying to reestablish communication. Like, I want to make this a, a thing. It made me appreciate Kenneth. I, I like him even more because he just seems like a really nice, honorable guy. But now we can talk about Bach, whom I love. He is so cute, so sweet, and just so wholesome. So when you meet Bach first, he tells you that he was thrown out of his cave. He was chased out, kicked out of this cave inhabited by demi-humans. And he says that they stole all of his belongings. They stole his sewing equipment. And when he goes back to try and retrieve it, they beat him up. And he warns you that they're just going to beat you to a pulp like they did him. Of course, we do not let little Bach cry like this. We go and we clear out the cave and we get his sewing equipment back. But I thought it was really interesting how they turned on him. I mean, clearly he's a demi-human too, so 
They took his stuff. Were they upset that he was learning how to sew? Were they upset that he was showing these kind of human tendencies? And when you give him back his sewing needle, he's just so happy. He's so grateful. He says that his mother was a seamstress and it's his dream to become a seamster. And from that point on in the game, he does become your seamster. At some point, Melina will tell you that she sees Bach crying from time to time and that he misses his mother and he just wants someone to tell him that he's beautiful. And as you get to know Bach a bit more, he does talk about his insecurities with his appearance. He calls himself ugly. He feels that he's being held back by his ugliness. And it's just so sad hearing him talk like this. But it made me think, does he think he's ugly because he's a demi-human? This is some sort of self-loathing. He doesn't like the association because Bach will never outright mention why it is that he's the only demi-human that you talk to it's it's not really ever addressed at all so this is a really big question for me but of course we don't want Bach thinking that he's ugly and thankfully we are able to tell him that he's beautiful by using this prattling pate and this says that it was sculpted in the shape of a demi-human head and that it it's unconditional love unrestrained assurance it must have been a mother speaking you're beautiful and when you use this for Bach, he just melts. It means so much to him. He says, thank you for letting me hear my mother's voice. She was the only one that ever called me beautiful. And it's so sweet, but it brings up this question of who is Bach's mother. So I thought, was there any chance that Bach's mother was also the mother of other demi-humans? Could this prattling pate be used on them? as well to get a different reaction but unfortunately i was proven wrong <laughs> it does not work at all in fact it seemed like it only made them more upset so i had to throw that theory out the window so the mystery of who is box mother still exists i wasn't able to un unearth anything and when you go to hermit village and you find the prattling pate that's the location you find um you find this dead demi-human body and i thought Oh, maybe the eyes look different. Is this like visually different? But no, it's just it's just a standard dummy human body. So I don't think that's Bach's mother. I actually think the prattling pate looks a lot like the head of a demi human queen. It looks like it has the same pointy ears and the teeth maybe look the same. So I don't know. It's so hard. There's no more information. I wish there was. We can only make assumptions because Bach is very well educated. He's very, very well behaved, like very mild mannered, and he's very um, knowledgeable. So when you when you show him the gold sewing needle, he immediately knows what it is. He knows about the royal seamstresses. He was very well loved by his mother unconditionally and he wants to follow in her footsteps. She taught herself how to sew. He says that she learned how to sew from scratch, but somewhere in Bach's bloodline is a very sweet little dummy human. I wish we knew more about her, but unfortunately it looks like she's going to have to remain a mystery at this time. There's an incantation you can learn. The text at the bottom of it says, having gained intelligence, the beasts must have felt how their wildness slipped away as civilization took hold. And this made me question as to whether or not demi-humans are considered beasts if they fall under that category or are they something different? Because that line about intelligence is also used on the staff as them having low intelligence. So I, I really don't know. But in that bestial sanctum, there are these figureheads and they sort of reminded me of those wooden mermaid figureheads on the front of like pirate ships. And I thought, oh, they kind of look like a demi-human body, right? Like the elbows and the ribcage. Ribcage is slightly different, but it kind of looks the same. And the fur, the gray fur, looked like box gray fur. Unfortunately, this is just... There's not a lot here for the demi-humans, and I think I have even more questions now. Like, I really want to know the demi-human's mother. Like, when was she taken? What And who is she? Is she someone very relevant? Like, box mother is... Are these going to be important characters? Is it someone like we already know that's a very obvious answer? It might be. I might have overlooked something. It might have already been answered. So if so, feel free to clear that out for me. <laughs> I tend to overlook things. Not overlook, but maybe make a connection that isn't exactly there. So sometimes I need some hand-holding. <laughs> or being pulled back from the ledge. But yeah, it's just it's so fun to look at this stuff. I think it's just... There's a lot of 
cute little details there and it just makes you appreciate them more you know they're not just this enemy this scary enemy they put together for the game no oh, they gave them some backstory they had some history they gave them purpose and some intention so just think it's really interesting to look at them in that way but yeah thanks so much for watching everybody and i'll see you next time bye